um, have you share your slides now. And uh, I will turn the podium over to you to uh, teach us about bladder cancer this morning. Thanks again for joining us, appreciate it. Thank you. So, uh, let's see if I can get this out of the way. No, uh, okay. So, we're, we're going to talk about uh, the challenges of treatment for high risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer in an era of BCG shortage. And uh, just to, as we alluded to, I just want to show you some of my uh, disclosures. Uh, I think that this is pretty up to date. And uh, almost all of these companies are involved with bladder cancer research and bringing new products to the market. Uh, when we talk about the BCG shortage, and the BCG shortage is real and it's not going to go away until we get other companies uh, making BCG in the United States, meaning that they have FDA approval. The uh, uh, Merck is the only company that makes Tice BCG. They're making more BCG than they ever uh, did before. They're making it quicker, but still they're just not able to keep up with the demand. So one of the things that's critically important in, in treatment of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is the importance of the TURBT. And we just uh, uh, published a, uh, a paper called TURBT, the Neglected Procedure and the Technology Race in Bladder Cancer. It was kind of an editorial. Uh, I think it's in Nance, uh, Lancet Urology, uh, but it talks about um, uh, that the overwhelming majority of bladder cancer patients will undergo uh, TURBT, and for the majority, 75% whose disease is non-muscle invasive, uh, the TURBT is the mainstay of the surgical management of their cancer. All too often, urologists believe that, all oh, it doesn't matter about the TURBT, will clean everything up with intravascular therapy. That is absolutely incorrect. The TURBT is not only uh, a diagnostic, it's not only important for staging, it can give you prognostic information by knowing the staging and the grading, and most importantly, it is therapeutic with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. If you can completely remove the tumor uh, with the TUR, you're in a much better uh, position. Uh, Again, I'm a uh, consultant for PhotoCure, but I truly believe that uh, blue light uh, CISU uh, does tr tremendously improve your ability to do a TURBT. I like, I like to say that it's like the difference between watching television in black and white versus watching it in color and high def. And there's no question in my mind that you'll see more and better with blue light. Uh, many cancers are not seen under white light. The recurrence rates uh, with blue light are 34.5% versus 45.4% with white light. There are no differences to date that we've uh, identified in progression, but there's no question the recurrence rate is lower because you're seeing more. And there's no question that there's a major, major difference with blue light cystoscopy when it comes to carcinoma in situ. Blue light cystoscopy with CISU and carcinoma site to the bladder, myth or reality. Patients underwent white and blue light cystoscopy, excluded patients with pathology reporting PT1, uh, PTA or greater. 79 single cystoscopies, TURBT with blue light cystoscopy with CISU, 135 lesions. And we see with blue light cystoscopy, we have a much higher sensitivity of 92.68% and the specificity of 45.74%, the positive predictive value of 42.7%, negative predictive value of 93.48%. <clears throat> There's no question that I have seen a number of patients throughout my career that had quote unquote negative white light cystoscopies and had positive urinary cytologies. When you, as you know, the Urinary cytology is highly specific with about a 95% likelihood that there will be cancer somewhere. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and that it's the urologist's job to find the, uh, uh, um, where the positive cytology is coming from. Most commonly it's the bladder and that I've seen many patients with normal cystoscopy, positive blue light cystoscopy and able to diagnose the carcinoma in situ. Well, what about using uh, PERI-TURBT intravascular chemotherapy to decrease the uh, risk of recurrence as well as to 
uh, eliminate or decrease the need for intravesical BCG? Well, we know that if you've got a low risk tumor, low risks are single, small, TA, non-invasive, low grade tumors, and you give a dose of, you can choose whatever uh, intravascular chemotherapy you want. I think that a lot of the data is on mitomycin, although there was a very nice paper published, a slog study, Ed Messing was the lead author using intravascular gemcitabine, so that if I'm gonna use a peri tur installation, I would use intravascular gemcitabine, and that we know in the low risk patients, the, uh, uh, there's a decreased recurrence rate and the effect lasts for approximately 500 days. If you've got intermediate risk, and intermediate risk are multiple tumors, recurrent tumors, low grade, TA high grade, less than three centimeters, or high risk tumors, there's uh, no benefit to a single dose of intravascular chemotherapy and that I don't use it in that regard. And I, think, I don't think it helps. As a matter of fact, uh, because of potential side effects you can get from mitomycin C, it may uh, slow down or decrease your ability to give a patient intravascular BCG or intravascular chemotherapy. What about the repeat TURBT? I think the repeat TURBT is critically important to manage high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, we're not nearly as good of resectionists as we think we are. I think that urologists are outstanding uh, endoscopists and outstanding resectionists, but when we look at multiple studies, multiple studies that where we performed a repeat TURBT four to six weeks after our initial TURBT, we'll find residual tumor in up to 75% of the cases, uh, will increase stage in up to 29% of cases, uh, it also may uh, predict progression. There was this nice paper by Harry Herr uh, a number of years ago looking at repeat TURBT for T1 high-grade disease. If you had residual T1 high-grade disease at your TURBT, you had about a 75 to 80% chance a risk of progression despite intravascular BCG. And again, I can't emphasize enough the importance of the therapeutic benefit of the repeat TURBT because your intravascular therapy will be more effective if all tumor has been removed. <laughs> now, uh, just, to, just to take a little step back about uh, intravascular BCG and the shortage, we know that intravascular BCG is um, associated with improved outcomes, decreased recurrences, and decreased progression. This is a paper that we're still trying to get published uh, uh, it's been, uh, we, we, we presented it multiple times at the AUA. Uh, it's gotten a lot of positive uh, 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 feedback. Why it hasn't been published yet, it's unclear. Uh, but this is using a SEER database looking at um, uh, intravascular BCG. And one of the things that we see is that number one, even patients with high risk uh, non muscle invasive bladder cancer, there are a few patients that get induction and maintenance. Uh, overall, uh, the number of patients who receive adequate BCG treatment, meaning an induction course followed by maintenance uh, BCG, is only about 29%. And so we clearly, uh, if we ever utilize BCG as much as we should for high-risk non-muscle invasive disease, we'll have even greater uh, shortages of intravascular BCG. And then this is just showing that uh, uh, from our uh, analysis that if you had uh, high risk, uh, intermediate risk, or even low risk uh, um, uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, you had a decreased risk of recurrence if you got adequate BCG versus inadequate BCG. So clearly, uh, BCG is our gold standard. Well, in the shortage, however, we should judiciously use a BCG uh, uh, and only treat the patients who would most likely benefit and you treat patients who wouldn't benefit or that you can use alternative therapies with those other therapies. And then also there are other strains, as we know, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Tokyo strain, but there are strains in Russia, there are strains in India, uh, uh, there are strains in uh, uh, throughout the world that potentially could be used in the United States if they were FDA approved. 
And the AUA Best Practice Guidelines in February of 19th of 2019, high risk, I mean, again, I want to emphasize high risk, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer uh, should receive induction BCG and they should be prioritized. Maintenance therapy, and again, it's critically important. All too often, I think people are saying, well, we've got enough BCG for induction. Let's forget about the maintenance. Maintenance BCG should be used in those high-risk patients, <coughs> albeit at a dose reduction. I've routinely used one-third dose of BCG, even when there was no BCG shortage, because I think, I thought, and I still believe, that patients tolerate it better, and as I'll show some data, uh, the efficacy should be the same. Intermediate risk disease. So these are the patients with low-grade disease, multiple tumors, uh, greater than three centimeter T8, greater than three centimeter recurrent tumors, or first time TA, high grade, less than three centimeters. Those patients primarily should be treated with intravesical chemotherapy prior, instead of BCG. Low grade disease, intravesical chemotherapy, not BCG. Again, the TURBT is critically important, and the intravesical chemotherapy is prophylaxis. And if you think about it, uh, BCG is immunotherapy. The immune system recognizes abnormal cells, abnormal DNA. If you've got low-grade disease, the cells uh, look relatively normal. There's just more of them. So it makes sense that the immune system may not be as effective against low-grade disease as it would be against high-grade disease. And my intravesical chemotherapy of choice right now is gemcitabine, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in later slides. Well, what about does the threefold decrease of BCG have the same efficacy against recurrence and progression of T1 high grade and carcinoma situ as the standard dose? This was an old trial in the Journal of Urology in 2005 from the Cueto, which is Spanish data. Prospective trial of 155 patients. Uh, complete excision with TUR, reduced dose versus standard dose, and as we'll see uh, uh, from this table and then also graphically that the time to recurrence uh, is pretty much similar. Uh, there may be uh, some slight differences or slightly increased risk of recurrence in the uh, 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 one-third dose. However, it's not statistically significant. The time to progression is no different. So my feeling is, is that uh, uh, if there's no difference in progression, the recurrence may be slightly different, better TUR, uh, you know, you may need uh, additional uh, BCG, but I, I think, uh, and I've been doing this for quite some time, I dose reduce. Now, the other thing you have to remember is that not all vials of BCG are the same. Not all lots of BCG are the same. And so that you may be, see a tenfold difference in one lot in terms of the colony forming units of BCG versus another lot. So that really uh, even a full dose of BCG in a lot that's tenfold reduced is, is not the same as, as a other lot. And so, you know, you've got plenty of wiggle room. I think the data would suggest that once you get below one sixth of a vial, you do lose some efficacy. But I think that in a world where you don't have any BCG, dose reduction makes a lot of sense. In terms of billing, uh, that's another issue, and that's something that we're going to have to work, continue to work on with the FDA. But what about different strains of BCG, with or without vaccine? So we know about the uh, uh, TICE versus Tokyo strain. This is a SWOG trial, 1602. Uh, arm one is TICE BCG uh, induction and maintenance. Arm two is Tokyo BCG induction and maintenance. And arm three is Tokyo BCG induction and maintenance with Tokyo uh, uh, BCG priming. <coughs> the concept is that you can prime the immune system. You give a sub-Q injection of, uh, of BCG and that you should theoretically get even uh, more uh, 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 immunologic effect. We do know that in Europe, in populations where uh, uh, people were, were uh, vaccinated with uh, BCG uh, when, when they were young, uh, it's anti-tuberculosis uh, 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 prophylaxis or vaccination, that, that they have a lower uh, incidence of, 
of bladder cancer potentially, but more importantly, that they seem to respond better to BCG. And that's kind of the, this concept of priming uh, uh, in the adult population. And then this is the, uh, uh, the schema of the Tice versus Tokyo uh, uh, strain. We're hoping that uh, the study is completed. Uh, I believe that there's about 600 of the 900 patients are accrued. It's been accruing very rapidly in, this, in the BCG shortage because Merck is guaranteeing the, the BCG for this trial. Uh, but as you know, the FDA process in the past, uh, it was pretty arduous. Potentially with the COVID-19 uh, 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 epidemic, pandemic, <coughs> that uh, the FDA may loosen up a little bit in terms of, of getting drugs to market. Uh, intravascular uh, chemotherapy, current agents, and alternative delivery. Alternative delivery is key because you know, the, the pharmacokinetics of intravascular chemotherapy, to my mind, just doesn't work. You put chemotherapy in the bladder, it's there for about an hour or two, it may or may not be uh, uh, absorbed completely, uh, and then you urinate it out. That's not how we give chemotherapy for any other disease. The way we give chemotherapy for any other disease is typically intravenously. It's in your body, into your bloodstream for uh, anywhere from 12 to 24 to 36 plus hours, uh, because you have to get the cells in, in S phase if you want to kill them. And so uh, uh, alternative delivery, I think, makes a lot of sense as well as to improve uh, uh, absorption. So this is a trial <coughs> published in 2013. Isla Skinner what was the uh, PI. It was a SWOG trial looking at uh, intravascular gem cytobine. These were patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer uh, that recurred after two prior courses of BCG. And note that 11% of the patients were multifocal, low-grade tumors. So this was not a, a homogeneous population, but they did recur despite intravascular BCG. And they got six weekly treatments followed by monthly insulation for one year, which is the way that I uh, give intravascular gemcitabine. There are others. There was a paper uh, published by Guido Dalbani from Memorial that was giving uh, three weeks of, of gemcitabine waiting a two to three weeks, giving another three weeks, and then giving a maintenance course. <coughs> so uh, <coughs> while all too often we follow the BCG pattern to giving it once a week for six weeks with uh, BCG, which does make sense in terms of immunologic function, it doesn't necessarily make uh, perfect sense to be giving uh, intravascular chemotherapy once a week for six weeks, and potentially you can give it uh, uh, every other week. Uh, again, depends on how well the patients tolerate it. In general, patients tolerate intravascular gemcitabine very well. Now, one of the things that people have been uh, writing about, uh, Mike O'Donnell has really been the advocate for this, looking at the combination of intravascular gemcitabine and docetaxel. So rather than just starting with one drug or, or if patients uh, recur, uh, going ahead to two drugs. And now in the BCG shortage, a lot of people are going to this uh, as their, uh, for BCG naive patients, high risk non-muscle invasive. This is, was recently published in the Journal of Urology. This is uh, before that uh, Journal of Urology article came out, but a retrospective review of data from several institutions uh, failed at least induction BCG. And again, patients don't fail BCG. BCG fails the patients. 276 patients included. Median follow-up was uh, not quite two years. <clears throat> and if we look at the data, the table's kind of busy, but when we look at uh, retrospective data, 239 high-grade patients, 37 uh, low-grade intermediate risk, 173 carcinoma in situ, and 105 were high-grade uh, BCG unresponsive disease. Median follow-up, we see that uh, there's 96.7% uh, received full treatment, 59.9% <coughs> no uh, side effects or, or some relatively minor LUTs. 16% uh, underwent cystectomies, uh, uh, but that overall we see some pretty significant uh, response rates. Uh, 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 we see for high grade, the recurrence free survival for, for all patients at 24 months is 46%. Uh, 
for all high grade patients, 52%. Uh, for the uh, high grade recurrence free survival, BCG and responsive carcinoma in situ, about 50%. So that we can certainly see some uh, uh, impressive results um, in, in, with the intravascular uh, gem cytobine, uh, gem cytobine uh, docetaxel. We need to do prospective trials. We need to look at, at more homogeneous populations. By and large, patients tolerate this pretty well. Uh, having said that, it's logistically not so easy to tie up a room uh, for th uh, three to four hours. Um, uh, you know, the, the nursing issues in terms of giving chemotherapy issues. But, but uh, uh, I think that it is certainly something uh, to keep uh, in mind. And uh, Jim McKiernan uh, at Columbia is looking at uh, multiple combinations of intravascular chemotherapy. So not just two drugs, but three drugs and four drugs. Uh, I think that, that uh, more is not necessarily better and that there's no question that more intravascular chemotherapy can lead to more local urinary tract symptoms. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> what about targeted therapy? So we, we routinely use intravascular BCG, but what about targeted therapy? Well, we know that for many patients with uh, urothelial carcinoma, that there are FGFR3 mutations. And that in the non-muscle invasive space is probably uh, at least 60%. Some may think it's as high as uh, uh, 80%. Muscle invasive, oh, probably uh, 30%, probably closer to 20%. Metastatic, about 20% uh, of patients with metastatic urethelial cancer have FGFR3 mutations. One of the interesting uh, questions is carcinoma in situ. How many patients with carcinoma in situ have FGFR3 mutations? unclear, but probably not nearly as many as we uh, uh, would like. Um, uh, and that we know that uh, 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 patients with FGFR3 mutations, there's an enrichment in the luminal one type of pathway, which is immunoquiescent, immunoquiescent. So in general, patients with FGFR3 mutations associated with beta cantonin went uh, cold tumors, tumors that don't have a lot of immune cells involved in them. So to give uh, a cold tumor or an FGFR3 mutated tumor, uh, an immunotherapy doesn't make a lot of sense. And so that clearly um, uh, treating those patients with an FGFR3 uh, inhibitor does make sense. And we do have a drug, erdofitinib, which is, is FDA approved in metastatic urothelial cancer second line in patients with FGFR3 mutations or fusions. We have a clinical trial <coughs> that's opening up worldwide. I am the uh, uh, PI of the study uh, in, in the US. And we're gonna be looking at a number of cohort of patients. These are patients that have had intravascular BCG, at least induction BCG. Although in the BCG shortage era, we're trying to make this new definition of a BCG uh, uh, experience or BCG exposure, meaning that they've got some BCG, unclear how much, may have gotten induction, may not have gotten induction, may have gotten a little bit more, but they've had some BCG. And despite that, they've recurred. And that the rationale is that these are then screened. You've got to do sequencing, next generation sequencing. There's going to be a companion diagnostic with this test looking for FGFR3 mutations and fusions. If you have one, then you can be put on this trial <coughs> and you're gonna be randomized mm -hmm. for, with erdofitinib versus uh, uh, dealer's choice of intravascular chemotherapy. And the dealer's choice we're gonna allow is gemcitabine or mitomycin C. Uh, we're looking at a papillary group. We're gonna see if there is a carcinoma in situ cohort, although we're not uh, clear that they will find many of those. That's a small part of the study. <clears throat> and then we're also going to look at some marker lesions uh, uh, to see if, if uh, erdofitinib, oral erdofitinib, is effective. Now, we do know that erdofitinib is associated with some side effects, and uh, we'll talk about that in uh, another second. Uh, Gemris is a, a pretzel. It's made by Terrace Biomedical, and it's a silicone tube and you can put all kinds of, of drugs, not just gemcitabine, but all kinds of drugs in the tube. 
And these tubes have holes drilled into them <laughs> so that <laughs> drugs that are put in the tube uh, leach out by osmotic diuresis, uh, uh, osmotic uh, pressure, and so that you can slowly release any drug you want into the bladder. Uh, uh, you put this little silicone tube in through a catheter and it forms into a pretzel so that patients cannot void it out. This is a study that we used, that we did looking at patients with muscle invasive disease prior to cystectomy. And we saw some, some significant benefits of intravascular uh, gemris. Uh, one of the things that you have to understand is that gemcitabine is not just a chemotherapeutic drug, a nucleoside analog, but it's also a drug that uh, theoretically depresses or uh, eliminates T regulatory cells as well as myeloid derived, uh, myeloid derived suppressor cells. So it, we believe it has a chemotherapeutic as well as an immunotherapeutic function. And the reason why I bring this up right after the erdofitinib talk is because Janssen just purchased uh, Terrace, and they're working uh, now to be able to put erdofitinib into the into the Terrace pretzel, so it'd be a erdofitinib uh, pretzel. Uh, to see if we can eliminate <coughs> all of the systemic toxicity of erdofitinib, which is hyperphosphatemia. There can be some changes in the eyes. There are some nail bed and skin changes. And so that if we can decrease the toxicity with the pretzel, I think it would, be, uh, 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 would make a lot of sense and would be potentially um, uh, important. Well, Chemohyperthermia is something that is being used a lot in uh, Europe. A combat system is a box that heats chemotherapy up to 43 degrees centigrade. And that the concept is, is that by heating the chemotherapy, you get much greater absorption. So this is a high VEC trial, 68 intermediate high-risk patients. Uh, they got eight uh, weekly treatments. <coughs> uh, mitomycin C neoadjuvant versus TURBT plus mitomycin C uh, plus times four uh, and weekly and once a month for 11 months. In the high VEC arm, uh, we see a 61.8% uh, T0 rate. So this is using heated mitomycin C not as prophylaxis, but as a chemoablation agent. This is to remove a tumor to replace TURBT. And we see that we get about a 62% a T0 rate. Uh, uh, 10 patients had a partial response with 50% reduction and three patients with no response. <coughs> the recurrence-free survival in the high VEC uh, arm was 79.5% versus 61.8% in the patients with TURBT plus uh, adjuvant mitomycin C. Uh, uh, Parenthetically, and this was uh, when this talk was uh, made, it was before the data came out, we're going to see another AUA presentation of uh, uh, mitogel. This is mitomycin C put in the gel. Uh, again, it's a chemoablative agent put in the bladder uh, instead of TURBT. Again, we see a complete response rate in the intermediate risk patient population of around 60 plus percent. So uh, uh, putting it in the bladder is a gel versus heating uh, the mitomycin. Uh, uh, and this is actually the preliminary data. Uh, we see uh, in the mito gel, we see it's once a week for six weeks. <laughs> and the total enrolled initially with 32 patients is gonna be a larger study. And we're gonna see more data. This is again, intermediate risk, 63% uh, chemoablation. <coughs> How about chemohyperthermia with mitomycin C and BCG naive high risk non muscle invasive patients? This is where the real benefit is in the BCG naive, where we no longer have BCG. Uh, it's a European trial induction with maintenance. Uh, 116 patients, mean follow up was 22 months. 80% received a minimum of six weekly installations. 55% of the patients received some maintenance therapy, <coughs> and the recurrence-free uh, rate was 83%, progression-free rate to T2 disease, 93%. Again, no BCG world, heat your mitomycin C using, the, uh, using a uh, box, 
um, and uh, potentially we can uh, uh, have a useful alternative. In the future, we may be able to use photodynamic therapy, uh, 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 fluorescent cystoscopy and photodynamic therapy. Photoactive porphyrins are preferentially accumulate in the neoplastic tissue. Uh, we can see it better with blue light. Uh, if we use uh, 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 some type of uh, uh, concentration, we may be able to ablate these tumors with uh, blue light. So that's uh, something for the future. Uh, uh, it's unlikely to treat invasive carcinoma to, due to lack of penetration, uh, but certainly uh, uh, in the non-muscle invasive space, uh, it may be very effective. What about antibody drug conjugates? So, uh, uh, Arpertumaz uh, monotox is a antibody drug conjugate. It's a novel fusion protein designed for increased tumor targeting and safety. <laughs> it's designed to deliver drug uh, uh, faster and better uh, than systemic absorption. Uh, it's designed to kill a broad array of cancer cells within the targeted tumor while reducing impact on healthy tissues. It targets EPCAM antigens presented on the surface of bladder cancer cells <coughs> to deliver a payload. And in, in this uh, combination, it's a pseudomonas endotoxin. Uh, and it's uh, relatively efficient and easy to make. Uh, and that, in theory, it may cause immune cell death. And you can combine it with uh, uh, a, a checkpoint inhibitor. But uh, Again, in a world where you don't have BCG, this is a targeted immunotherapy. It's to uh, deliver, uh, to bind with the EPCAM, which is enriched in bladder cancer. However, when we look at uh, the cinium, opportumaz uh, monotox, in uh, the BCG unresponsive patient population, uh, we see a complete response rate at, uh, uh, at three months, around 40%. But the duration of response at 12 months is in the 14 to 17 percent range. <coughs> they're looking for FDA approval in the BCG and responsive space, unclear that they're going to make it. Uh, in this trial, this phase three trial in the BCG and responsive, they gave uh, every uh, two, twice a week for six weeks, uh, once a week for six weeks, and every other week for up to 24 months. It's a lot of treatment with uh, not a lot of long-term efficacy. Oncofid is a uh, bioconjugate of paclitaxel and hyaluronic acid for intravesical installation. <clears throat> uh, the uh, hyaluronic acid binds uh, to the CD44 uh, surface markers that are preferentially uh, in bladder cancer. Uh, there's an enrichment of CD44 uh, surface uh, uh, membrane proteins in bladder cancer and the hyaluronic acid binds very strongly and releases the paclitaxel into the uh, uh, bladder. And then this is just a, uh, a picture of it <coughs> and that this has been looked at. It's, this is an Italian company. They've done trials in Italy. We're hoping to uh, bring them to the United States, uh, but uh, it's a Another way to deliver uh, intravascular chemotherapy uh, more uh, directed and to uh, potentially replace intravascular BCG. What about novel immunotherapies? Well, this is a, a, a vaccine that I've been working with for a long time, CG0070. We presented this at the AUA a number of times. Vig Pakium, uh, Vignesh Pakium, who's uh, uh, finishing up his SUO fellowship at, uh, uh, at the Mayo Clinic and soon to join Mike O'Donnell at the University of Iowa. I'm a faculty, has uh, presented this a number of times. <laughs> and this is a type 5 adenovirus with a couple of genes at the uh, E1A, uh, E2F uh, promoter region, as well as the GMCSF region. This is a uh, viral killing as well as uh, immune uh, stimulant. And we've looked at it in the BCG unresponsive uh, patients. Uh, and we see that there are uh, a number of patients that have had a good response at the 12-month uh, response. Uh, we've got about a 27% in carcinoma in situ. Uh, again, this was, uh, the study was closed early because we ran out of vaccine. 
<clears throat> it's not exactly a pure uh, BCG unresponsive population, but again, an oncolytic vaccine with a GMCSF, another alternative to use it in the BCG naive population, especially in a world where there's no BCG. And then uh, this is a, another uh, type of uh, five adenovirus, nanoferrogene, uh, feretinec, we call it, uh, it's known as adstilidrin. The phase three trial has been closed. Uh, and we saw uh, uh, very nice responses. Again, this is a BCG unresponsive population. It's got a gene in it for a type 1 interferon. We know that type 1 interferons are an important part of the innate immune system that ultimately turn on uh, an adaptive immune response. And that the data showed that a complete response in carcinoma in situ patients with or without resected papular disease at three months, about a 53%. <coughs> CR and that the duration of response at 12 months was about 25%. Uh, again, I think that this is a vaccine which is given once every three months that potentially will move into uh, the patients uh, that have gotten a, a six week course, an induction course of BCG and recurred, uh, or even potentially in a BCG naive population, although it's, a, it, it's going for FDA approval in the BCG unresponsive space. Sting agonists, again, uh, the sting is a stimulator of interferon genes, uh, typically uh, type uh, 1 interferons. This is an important part of the innate immune system. Uh, there are broadly expensed innate sensor intracellular DNA activates C gas in production of the sting agonist, cyclic GMP, GM, G, CGAMP. And it turns on the innate immune system and ultimately the adaptive uh, response. Uh, mechanisms of BCG and response may not interfere with the response to the sting uh, pathway and to macrophages or receptor loss. In general, you, uh, the, the trials to date have been intratumoral injection, but I'm working with a duro to uh, see if we can put it in the bladder in an intravesical uh, solution to turn on the sting gas pathway. Again, no BCG. This is a, a, a innate uh, a sensor. BCG, we believe, works by an innate immune system turning on NK cells and gamma delta T cells. <coughs> this potentially would be a, an alternative. Uh, another is uh, imicomod, is, which is a, a TLR7. TLR7 is uh, uh, also uh, turns on the innate immune system. Uh, we also believe that it may uh, simulate uh, uh, IL-6, which is, uh, uh, causes inflammation. We know a lot about IL-6 now because of COVID-19 and the anti-IL-6 to decrease the cytokine release storm syndrome. Uh, we also uh, turns on IL-18, which is an important stimulant for uh, CD8 T cells. Currently in trials is uh, uh, alter alt Alt, uh, what's actually immune, immunity bio, ALT-803, which is an IL-15, intravesical IL-15. IL-15 is a NK <coughs> and CD8 T cell stimulant, but uh, mostly NK. We know that NK cells is a predominant form of killing uh, in, for cancer uh, with oncolytic vaccines, uh, with BCG, uh, and it's becoming a, a more prominent a role in, in uh, uh, cancer biology and immunobiology of cancer using uh, NK uh, stimulants. And there are even uh, uh, trials that are using uh, NK uh, uh, bound with uh, 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 CD19 uh, in the CAR T cell therapy to uh, increase our ability to kill cancer with a combined uh, 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 CAR T cell uh, approach. <coughs> And then let's not forget about cystectomy. <clears throat> uh, there's no question that uh, there are many patients or there are going to be a cohort of patients who are going to have uh, cystectomies earlier rather than later, given the fact that there's a shortage of BCG. And that the patients to consider cystectomies on <coughs> are patients with high-risk features, multifocal T1 high grade, high volume T1, not manageable by TUR, residual T1 disease at restaging TUR, 
uh, concomitant disease in the prostatic urethra, tumors that deeply invade the lamina propria or extensively invade the lamina propria, concomitant CIS, lymphovascular invasion, micropapillary variant, and BCG unresponsive disease. All of these patients uh, 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 should, should be strongly considered and, and counseled early on uh, for uh, cystectomy. This is an old study, a re retrospective review of 189 patients with T1 high-grade disease. They had to have a larger tumors, multifocal disease, or concomitant CIS. Uh, 105 patients, 51 had early cystectomy, 49 delayed uh, cystectomy. And as we see, the early cystectomy patient population uh, uh, had a better outcome. However, there are a number of other studies that would report that there's no uh, uh, difference and there's no added benefit to early cystectomy. Uh, so I think that it has to be uh, uh, a case by case basis, but there's no question <clears throat> that for the younger, healthier patient, I believe early cystectomy is a significant benefit. So in conclusion, uh, uh, BCG shortage is the new normal. Uh, one of the things that we're talking about with this uh, making a, a vaccine for, for COVID-19 is we want to speed up our vaccination, uh, uh, vaccine development. One of the things that Merck has said over and over again, that you can't just build another factory to make a, a biologic. It, it, it's, a, it's a complicated manufacturing process. It would take, uh, Merck says it would take them five to 10 years to have another facility to make additional BCG. So that when we talk about making a, a, a vaccine and mass producing it and distributing it uh, by Christmas uh, or even by you know uh, 2021, it's going to be a daunting challenge, and I just hope that industry is up to it. But BCG shortage is the new normal. Uh, better uh, TURBT, smarter utilization of BCG, new approaches, delivery systems. <clears throat> combination chemotherapy, oncolytic vaccines, antibody drug conjugates, cytokine therapy, sting agonists, FGFR3 inhibitors, and early radical cystectomy. Thank you, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Steinberg. That was a really awesome review of, uh, um, you know, bladder cancer treatment, all the exciting uh, drugs that are in the pipeline. I was not aware of some of those last ones that you mentioned, and those all seem very, very promising. Um, you did mention, um, you know, vaccine development when it comes to COVID. What, have you looked into what people are kind of talking about when it comes to BCG as a treatment for COVID? And what do you think about that? Yeah. So uh, Ashish Kamad and a number of people are, are getting involved. And, and to use a BCG, not intravascular, but sub-Q inoculation for healthcare workers, there is some data to suggest you know, one of the things about all vaccines is that uh, in a perfect world, we believe that the vaccine is very, very targeted and specific. But we know that with all the vaccines, there is a lot of off-target effects. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, if you, if you look in the third world, a malarial vaccine, uh, which is they're still being looked for, but if you've got, you've got other vaccines that are given to children, it may protect them against malaria, may protect them against yellow fever. Uh, and, and again, so we're looking at, 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 at just kind of the overall immune stimulation that we get from a vaccine and the innate immune system, which is critically important. We keep thinking about vaccines in the adoptive, adaptive immune system, but the uh, overall benefit of, of vaccination may also be to strengthen a, a person's innate immune system. And that may have some benefit against any uh, virus, although I think it's a pretty big leap of faith to think that it's going to have much protection against COVID. I think people are probably somewhat grasping at straws right now. So whatever, yeah. uh, whatever they can test or throw around. Uh, there are a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, let's see. Dr. Uh, Raman asked, if you already give the first 24-hour intravesical chemotherapy after an initial TRBT, do you still give another dose of chemotherapy after a re-TRBT? So again, I only do repeat TURBT for high-grade non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And I strongly believe that the treatment for those patients is, go are, is going to be intravascular immunotherapy, BCG, if you have it. <coughs> uh, I think that uh, 
all you have to do and see one patient in your life that's gotten a peri TUR installation of mitomycin C who is miserable. Mm. And, you know, you've got to be very careful when you give it, if there's any extravasation. And so you'll see a patient with just horrific lower urinary tract symptoms that you're going to try every treatment you know, and that most get better, but it can take six to 12 months. They may always have some calcifications in their bladder. And so I really think that the only patient that you should consider um, uh, using a peri-TUR mitomycin C, especially mitomycin C, is a low-risk patient, a small tumor that you've easily resected, you didn't perforate, you didn't extravasate, and you want to see if you can decrease their recurrence rate. Actually, I'd prefer to use gemcitabine in that situation. But in somebody with, that I'm doing a repeat TURBT has got high-grade disease, and I'm not going to give them a peri-TUR dose. I'm thinking more of an induction plus maintenance treatment. Um, let's see. Dr. Ram Gopal asked, do you think that if someone has had the BCG vaccine in the past, uh, would they benefit um, against recurrence, uh, I guess, when it comes to bladder cancer treatment? Yeah, I mean, I think that, again, you know, we, 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 we learned a lot about uh, 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 classifying patients. And so that if you've had high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and you recur within 12 months versus between 12 and 24 versus greater than 24, it puts you in different uh, risk categories. And so that clearly if you've gotten an adequate course of BCG, six plus three, and you've recurred within 12 months, you are a high risk for disease progression and more BCG is not going to help you. If on the other hand, you've gotten some BCG, <coughs> you've gotten some BCG, you've been disease free for two years, you get, you know, recur again, I absolutely give BCG. If you've gotten BCG in maintenance uh, uh, for a year and then two years later you recur, the question becomes, can you just give three weeks of BCG or do you have to give another induction? But, but certainly, uh, you, you, you have to think about the time frame. When was the last BCG? What was the recurrence? And if it's high grade, then you have to be concerned about uh, progression and more BCG is not going to help. Gotcha. Uh, someone's asking, what is your opinion about uh, Synergo therapy? Synergo therapy? I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, so Synergo is, is uh, again, heating... Um, mitomycin C, but it's a little bit different than the combat. The combat is actually heating the drug. Mm. Synergo uses radio, radio frequency to heat the bladder wall. Uh, so it's not, and, and, and by heating the bladder wall and putting in the drug, uh, you then, again, you're trying to increase your absorption of the drug. It's a much more complex uh, technique. Uh, it takes forever. It's uh, a lot of potential a lower urinary tract system uh, symptom uh, toxicity <clears throat> and it's you've got to watch it continuously it's not like you go turn it on you walk away and you're you know doing 12 systems I mean you've got to have a nurse in there all the time there was a trial that was open in the United States and from what I understand it closed uh, because of poor accrual and they were having some difficulty so it's been a technology around for a long time that hasn't really gotten any traction I think that uh, the combat system is easier to use um, um, but we still need to look at prospective randomized data in the combat system as well versus just mitomycin. Gotcha. Uh, let's see, Eric Katz said, can you review your algorithm for a healthy 60-year-old man with high-grade T1 bladder cancer who does not tolerate full-dose induction BCG and the end <laughs> cystectomy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, again, I, I, I think that... Um, I think that pretty much everybody could tolerate BCG. You, you really have to kind of work at it a little bit. Uh, but, you know, all too often those patients that don't tolerate BCG, they have such a uh, inflammatory bladder cancer or they've got enough uh, disease in their bladder that uh, they're probably safer to go on to cystectomy. Um, uh, I, I think that, that, you know, it's interesting in New York, uh, that there seems to be a lot of patients that uh, uh, decide how they want to be managed and that uh, they've read the internet or they've so forth and they, oh, I, you know, I don't want to have my bladder out. Well, you know, well, there was a nice talk uh, by Rafe Devere White at the SUO 
demonstrating that if you've got muscle invasive bladder cancer and you refuse cystectomy, you don't have cystectomy, uh, you say, you know, I'd rather die uh, than have my bladder removed. Well, you will, you know, and you'll die within 12 to 18 months and you'll die a pretty miserable death. Radical cystectomy is an outstanding operation when performed well and performed um, uh, timely. Uh, uh, I think content urinary diversion uh, works very, very well as long as patients understand uh, about voiding and nocturnal enuresis and time voiding and getting up at night. Uh, and so if I've got a 60-year-old who's healthy and can't tolerate BCG, while we do have some trials, uh, I would tell them that to date, uh, the trials, uh, in best case scenario, you may have a, a, a complete response at 12 months of, of uh, 25%. Best case scenario, uh, Pembro, we see a 20% uh, duration response. Uh, and that radical cystectomy is probably the best form of treatment. All right, uh, I think we have time for one more question here. Um, Dr. Patel asked, um, let's see. Uh, he's voided urine. He said, voided urine after BCG installation may still have some activity. Have you heard anything about salvage use or I guess recycling the voided urine? Yeah, uh, I don't think, I mean, you, you, you You'd have to use it right away. I mean, I, I think that the BCG organism does not stay, is not viable beyond about eight, eight to 10 hours. Yeah. So it, unless you would get that voided urine and put it into somebody else's bladder in a couple of hours, but. It's like a, like a sourdough starter. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. All right. Well, I think that's a great point for us to end on. Thank you.